Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bobby. I'm the co-founder and COO at CoinGecko. Thank you very much for everyone present today. Thank you very much, Paul Coin, for having me here today. So I'm going to be talking about the state of decentralized storage. Uh, my, mark, my market research team has read and kind of condensed kind of information on this topic, and, and I'm very happy that I can be here to kind of present on this topic today. So um, without further ado, yeah, so I think it's kind of good, good, good to start by kind of taking a snapshot of where we are with regards to storage. I think if you look at the amount of data generated globally, uh, in 2021, the world generated 78 zettabytes of data. That's kind of 78 billion terabytes of data. It's kind of a big number, 79 with 21 zeros following that. This, this, this more data um, generated is kind of projected to grow 4,400% up to year 2035, and we are projected to reach uh, 2,142 2, zettabytes of data. But if you think about it, like how much storage is um, um, stored on Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, the big tech companies, right? Uh, in 2019, they store about 1.9, uh, 1.2 million terabytes of data. And even projecting a 5x increase between 2019 and 2022, amount of data generated and amount of data stored on, on cloud solutions represents somewhat about 0.015%. So what it means is that it's just a tiny percentage of data that's created is stored online uh, in de decentralized storage as well. But I think to talk about the state of decentralized storage market, it's kind of useful to kind of go back and have a walk back in time to kind of see how it all started. So you kind of like go back 20 years in time to June 1999. For those of you who are old enough to remember Napster, that's kind of like where it all started. Uh, Napster was a P2P audio file sharing system created in June 1999, kind of revolutionized how decentralized file storage uh, uh, was created. Uh, Nutella came out. LimeWire, BitTorrent came out in the early 2000s as well. Uh, obviously, the hard part about all these things is that it boils down to the search. The search component is very centralized. A lot of them got taken down. Pirate Bay was kind of like a big thing that helps with all the torrent file system. It was finally taken down in July 2010. In February 2015, we saw IPFS, Interplanetary File System, uh, launch, and then we start seeing a suite of different decentralized storage providers coming on board into the market. Uh, we saw CR Network launching in June 2015. We saw Arif coming on and kind of maybe changing the, the landscape by doing permanent storage uh, in 2018. And, and then we saw Filecoin during the peak of the ICO bull run, did a massive ICO route, did $257 million worth of uh, fundraising for the token. Uh, Justin Sun for his Tron Foundation follow on and kind of acquired one of the original BitTorrent client uh, for $140 million. And then we saw StoreJ launch its mainnet in 2018. Uh, Justin Sun with BitTorrent kind of launched a BTFS system. And then I think the big thing, Filecoin launches a mainnet in October 2020. So it's kind of a very interesting um, landscape of how decentralized storage has kind of grown over the years. I guess the question is, why do we need decentralized storage? What are key differences between centralized and decentralized storage? There's a few key components to it. One of them is the data availability. Um, when it comes to centralized storage, it kind of works on a HTTP method, hypertext transfer protocol. You upload a file, it will reside on a specific location on some server somewhere, and you, know, you have to kind of have replications to kind of ensure the file is always there. If the file is deleted, then you get a 404, you get a bad link. On decentralized storage, files are kind of hashed and uploaded into the IPFS, Interplanetary File System. As long as there's a minor or validator online, your file's there to be downloaded. When it comes to security, um, not off, you, you kind of have to encrypt and, and, and store them if you want to encrypt your files if you want to have them on, on centralized storage. On decentralized storage, most of them offer encryption by default. Data integrity, if you modify a file on a particular link, you won't really know if the file's modified. Whereas with IPFS, IPFS, when you kind of, before you upload a file, a hash is generated. So even if you modify a file, make a slight modification, it will change completely the hash if, there's, if the file's been tampered with. When it comes to privacy, um, um, there's no way for the node to kind of read the content of the, network, of the data if it's kind of encrypted. Uh, obviously, it's uh, permissionless, um, censorship resistant. And when it comes to performance, maybe, 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 maybe centralized storage still has some advantages, but decentralized storage uh, is fast catching up, I would say. 
I guess the question is, who's using decentralized storage at this point in time? And I would say that there are maybe three main components to it. Uh, the main one being NFTs. Uh, when you buy an NFT, you kind of want your file to be available for years to come. And you don't really want your, your file to be hosted on someone's AWS or someone's Google Drive, and then this guy could like, decide not to pay his server bills one day, and then the NFT disappears. So images, audios, video files, they're pretty much too large to be stored on the blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain or any other blockchains, for example. Um, but using decentralized storage, you kind of upload them to you know, IPFS or RV or one of those places. And, 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 and like, interesting use cases like RV, for example, have permanent storage where you can kind of pay up front for 200 years and you kind of have, you, you have the comfort knowing that your files kind of, your, your, your NFT, your image is going to be there for, for years to come. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, for developers, um, you know, a lot of decentralized application developers, they, they host their, their files on IPFS, for example. Arve, one of the leading DeFi protocol on Ethereum and a few other chains, is one of the most famous examples. So their, 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 their dApp front end is hosted on IPFS. When you go to app.rv.com, you know, it has this notice saying that, you know, the front end is hosted on IPFS. It's not hosted on Arve servers, for example. Um, some of the developers as well also, also kind of like, you know, use IPFS, for example, to kind of create a snapshot of the blockchains, and then you can kind of download them very, uh, instead of like indexing the blockchain from the from first block all the way. So that's kind of another use case. Uh, and then everyday users, for example, right? Uh, users can kind of like store their files. Uh, if you have a lot of files, you can kind of store them pretty cheaply. Uh, obviously, cost competitiveness is one of the big advantages for decentralized storage. Uh, they are, obviously, it's not easy to use for many of these platforms. A lot of them requires API knowledge. But like you have some interesting use cases with uh, interesting uh, GUI uh, user interface, like uh, AR Drive on RV, for example, have like a decentralized Dropbox interface where you can kind of drop, drag and drop your files to upload to a, to a decentralized web. Um, and I think, I, think, I think interesting use cases as well for businesses, right? For example, some of them uh, who may be generating loads of data but do not really need to kind of access them very frequently. So you can think of them like CCTV recordings. You kind of generate a lot of like files from all the video recordings, kind of need to retain them for an extended period of time in case you ever need to access them, but you don't really need to access them every day. So these are kind of like use cases that are pretty interesting, I would say. I think there are two main components to separating the, the decentralized storage providers out there uh, when it comes to data persistent mechanism. Uh, sitting on one side is our reef where all the images and multimedia and all the files are actually stored on the Arweave blockchain itself. So you use this thing called a blockchain-based persistence method. So what ends up happening is you upload everything onto the dedicated blockchain run by Arweave, and, 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 and the miners kind of you know, take a random block from the, previous, uh, from, the, from the previous blocks to kind of ensure that the data is available. The, the block size, you can kind of imagine, like, if you upload everything to the Arweave blockchain, the block size is going to be massive, right? So the Arweave blockchain is about 92 terabytes right now. And I've seen blocks being created on Arweave where it's like one gigabyte per block. How this will scale moving forward, I think it'd be interesting to monitor how this scales moving forward. On the other side, we have contract-based persistence methods such as Filecoin, StoreJ, BitTorrent, Sia, where it's sort of instead of rep, uh, it, it, it replicates uh, the data across every node on a network, so you kind of choose how many nodes that you want your data to be replicated, for example. And also, like, you decide, basically, this kind of work, like, you want X amount of data to be, you know, uploaded, to be retained for Y period of time, and you pay X amount of dollars, for example, Z amount of dollars, for example. So this almost feels like a very, uh, you know, Web2 storage method, I would say. Uh, there's a lot of numbers over here, a lot of uh, comparisons between the, the, the different storage providers. So I'm not going to go too deep into it. Interesting thing, I guess, uh, Filecoin's got the largest market cap, $1.5 billion at this point in time, followed by BitTorrent, around $840 million. Uh, Arif, around third, around $546 million. Um, I guess for most of them, users can choose whether to you know, encrypt or don't encrypt the data when they upload. Um, I think the big difference is our Reef at this point in time have this permanent storage where you can kind of upload your data and like ensure that users endowment method and kind of have your, your data guaranteed to be up for 200 years. Interesting thing is I think Filecoin is kind of putting in the Filecoin virtual machine sometime towards the end of this year. And then with that, we can also have uh, pretty much permanent storage. So kind of have feature parity with our Reef, I suppose. 
Another interesting point to note as well is the last column uh, on the minimum hosting requirements. Uh, Filecoin RV has kind of the largest requirements. Uh, Filecoin requires eight cores. RV requires six cores. Uh, Filecoin eight cores, 136 gigabytes of data, 1.1 terabytes of hard disk space. Uh, RV is pretty high as well. Compared against BitTorrent, the requirements for running a node is significantly lower. You only need a one core CPU, one gig RAM, and 32 gig of hard disk space. And we will see implications for these differences on the next slide. So, and I showed you earlier the, the big differences in the number of the hardware requirements. And we can see over here, number of active nodes. Uh, RU has 69 uh, nodes running. Uh, Falcon has 4,000 plus nodes running. And, and BitTorrent, because of its lower system requirement, has over 4 million nodes. Obviously, data for this is kind of hard to come by. We may not be comparing uh, the same thing when we comparing apples to oranges, for example, but um, we, we kind of got this number, and, and BitTorrent may include some of this renters' data. It's kind of a bit vague how they define their nodes, right? Uh, but the point is, because of lower, lower requirement, you can kind of have a lot more nodes. I mean, BitTorrent also, some people kind of have multiple nodes running on the same IP address, so, so maybe they are running, like, containerized and, and running multiple nodes on the, on the same machines. That's kind of how they get, like, this pretty high number. I think an interesting point is um, to note as well next is what's with regards to capacity, right? In the last two years, the NFT bull market has sort of run, uh, grown, and, and we've sort of seen a lot of usage. If you take a look at the blue line over here, so um, you see that, that storage capacity has kind of grown 4x in the last two years, and we have about 21 million terabytes of capacity uh, across, all, across all the decentralized storage network. Of these 21 million terabytes of, of storage capacity, the bulk of them is provided by Filecoin. So Filecoin is the yellow line that you can see over here. We've got to break the, the axis on the left-hand side because it's just too much capacity, right? So Filecoin itself has 21 million terabytes of capacity. Uh, but if you think about the amount of capacity used, 99% of this storage capacity is unused. Only 1% of the Filecoin storage capacity is used at this point in time. So uh, why is this so? I think it's got a lot to do with the token incentive that's being offered by the Filecoin Foundation, and, and we are seeing uh, a lot of like, capacity. The Filecoin Foundation is kind of incentivizing, bootstrapping this network, a lot of storage capacity, and this excess capacity that we see in Filecoin will be reflected in the price of storing of Filecoin. I'll, I'll explain in my next slide. Um, I think you can see the blue, the blue line is the storage network. Uh, it's about 64% of the storage network is used to store data at this point in time. This is followed by Siacoin. Our reef is not uh, drawn here because it has 92 terabytes of data, so it's really tiny. And because all the data is stored on, on, on chain, it's like 100% of the capacity is kind of used at this point in time. So yeah, as I kind of explained, 99% of the Filecoin network storage capacity is unused. So this is kind of reflected in the price, right? So the price of monthly price per terabyte of storing data on Filecoin is it's really cheap. It's 0 0.0002 cent. And you can't beat that on any other decentralized storage providers. Our real storage is CRS about $1, $4. Uh, BitTorrent is about $3. And if you compare them against centralized providers, it's anywhere between uh, 5 to $7, for example. So decentralized storage, Filecoin, significantly cheaper compared to the rest. Uh, obviously, this only includes the storage cost. It doesn't really include the bandwidth cost. And yeah, there's obviously more cost to upload and, and download the data. When it comes to protocol revenue, uh, obviously, it's going to be hard comparing centralized and decentralized storage providers. Uh, we've kind of mapped AWS, Oracle, Dropbox over here. But obviously, it's, it's not really accurate in the sense that AWS obviously includes not just storage, but also includes compute and a bunch of different services. But if you take a, take a look at the decentralized storage providers, Filecoin, Arif, um, uh, Cialcoin, Filecoin is significantly higher when it comes to network revenue. This is Q2, about $13.3 million of network revenue. Obviously, a lot of them uh, is paid out in the, the native token. And it's been a challenging year, I would say, for the Filecoin team. Uh, the Filecoin token has gone down 85% this year, so, uh, which is pretty much in line with the <laughs> dropping cryptocurrency for a drop of every other cryptocurrency, I would say. Um, but yeah, uh, decentralized storage network is still growing, and we can expect as we build up more applications, use cases, the, the, the revenue, protocol revenue should grow for, for all of them. I guess if you look at the ecosystem, right, like which 
decentralized storage network has the most vibrant ecosystem. I would say that the two key players right now, Filecoin and Arweave, has like the most vibrant network. So in terms of Web3 storage, dev tooling, data market, consumer storage, marketplaces, socials, everything else, you can kind of see the various applications that have been placed in here. You see that Filecoin and Arweave has the most at this point in time. Filecoin has the second most. But I think a lot of them, uh, Filecoin is kind of dependent on Filecoin Virtual Machine uh, launching sometime towards the end of the year. And once that is up, you see developers having the ability, capability, to kind of build more things on top of Filecoin to kind of have feature parity with Arweave, I would say. Uh, Arweave kind of found a very interesting niche use case by going after this permanent storage thing, which is you know, pretty much impossible to be done on a, on a centralized storage, web to storage providers. So they've got this interesting narrative going along, and I think Filecoin, you know, once it has this thing, can kind of compete on that front as well. So I guess looking into the future, right, decentralized storage is part of the value chain of online computing. As a user, you want to have compute resource, you want to have comp storage resource. You, cannot choose, you can kind of choose to store on a blockchain or on a cloud. Uh, we choose on a, to store on a blockchain. There's immutable data, censorship resistant. It's usually cheaper, significantly cheaper in the case of Filecoin. Uh, it's not a cloud. It's obviously convenient. Um, you know, if you are a developer and use AWS, it's obviously easy to have a one-stop shop to kind of have all your, all your cloud solution uh, there, your, your compute, your storage, you know, and you're kind of familiar, you're used to it, you don't have to learn a new tooling, a uh, new mechanism. Um, obviously, cloud has a network effect. Uh, it's an incumbent, so it's got a lot of uh, uh, people, who are, a lot of talent who are used to doing it as well. Uh, so yeah, I guess understanding the competition, right? Like incumbents like AWS, Google Cloud, and, and so on, they have a massive head start when it comes to capturing the value chain, right? So there are three kind of differentiating factors or, or, or factors why, why they, they're still pretty strong. And I think decentralized storage have quite a lot of things to do to kind of catch up against these this Web2 players, right? Uh, what decentralized storage uh, is interesting, right, is it's only, it just represents just one small component of, of the developer's toolkit. Like, as I kind of mentioned, like a developer would prefer to kind of use a one-stop shop to get all their cloud solutions. You don't want to you know, use everything on AWS except for S3 where you want to kind of put on PowerPoint. It's kind of you know, tedious, cumbersome, billing is kind of like troublesome as well. It's just easier on one-stop shop. I think incumbents also have a lot of uh, cross-selling capabilities, a lot of funnel. So Google, for example, you use their Gmail, you, and then it comes with Google Storage. Uh, Microsoft, you use Hotmail, you come to storage, you have your office as well. It all uploads to the cloud. So there's a lot of cross-selling ability from the incumbents. And Web2 providers, I mean, Web3 providers like Filecoin, Alvi, they, don't, they don't really have this cross-selling funnel built in yet. So I guess that's something to kind of think about, like how do you kind of build or bake this usage into, the demand into the kind of existing uh, use cases, for example. And I guess the third point, I guess, over here is uh, the regulatory component to it, right? Um, data management is uh, pretty strict. Compliance with data management is pretty strict. Uh, GDPR kind of changed uh, things. Uh, there is this right to be forgotten. And for a lot of companies, um, you know, maybe things are still pretty murky on how do you handle data stored on decentralized storage, especially if things are permanent storage, like how do you even delete something that has been uploaded to permanent storage, for example. So a lot of companies may not be willing to take that risk at this point in time. Uh, things are still very uncertain, very unclear. Don't know if it's compliant or not compliant. So there's all these things that, that need to be worked out, education, for example, and so on. I guess the conclusion is, I think decentralized storage is very interesting. There's a lot of use cases, a lot of potential for it. But there's a lot of ground that we need to cover before it can go mainstream. Um, the incumbents, the Web2 incumbents, they have a huge advantage. So how do we close the gap? So, and also there's very little incentive to kind of migrate. Obviously, there are technical challenges, there are paper challenges. You know, you talk about uh, migration costs, uh, we talk about like learning costs, you talk about compliance, for example. All these things are challenges and issues that need to be tackled to kind of have uh, decentralized storage go mainstream. Uh, the incumbents have a very strong network effect. And I think 
one interesting use case is, what, what is interesting, I think, is for decentralized storage to kind of find its own unique angle. Uh, just like how decentralized storage found its kind of niche when it comes to NFTs and permanent storage, that's something that the centralized storage providers can't do or find it really hard to do. So that's an interesting niche that, that, that can be built upon. And how do we find more and more interesting use cases that the current Web2 incumbents don't really do? So that's kind of our challenge. And as long as we can, kind of keep doing that and kind of find ways to kind of chip onto the advantages that the Web2 providers have, I think we, decentralized storage will have a very bright future. future, uh, future. So yeah, that's all that I have today. Thank you very much. If you're interested in following me, I'm Bobby Young on Twitter and Coindex on Twitter. Thank you.